dancing the body in the world theme came out of the consideration of very much working in the world. Right? I travel vast amounts of time a year, um, now more than ever, but even back then, I was constantly on the road, on the road with uh, private clients, you know, last minute travel at all times. I literally would often get phone calls you know, the night before and then leave the next day, things of that nature, lots and lots of emails. Um, essentially running my business, running my personal uh, consulting business, uh, running this farm, having a life, having a husband, uh, in, having all these animals, um, did require something from my body that I didn't quite know how to uh, manage. And so I learned all of these things um, uh, that I'm now using through trial and error and also through pretty much burning myself out at some point. Um, there was a, an extra um, element. It was all fine and it could all be handled. And then my previous teaching partner, the guy I taught with before Steve died tragically in an accident. And then there went my adrenals and, uh, you know, a lot of other things, a very deep grief and very interesting shifts in, in the way I'd look at things in the context of um, you know, that whole experience. So the, um, the being in the world in a woman's body is essentially a consideration of what's quote-unquote natural and what's quote-unquote unnatural. And so I'm saying this natural and unnatural as in it's of course all natural because we're doing it. Um, there's no artificial part about us doing it. But there are things that are more innate to a woman's body and then there are things that are not quite so innate to a woman's body. And so the, um, the basic human um, disposition of a woman's body is reproduction. It doesn't matter if you had children or not or planning on having children or not. Um, as a species, that's really all that matters. Right? It's you, you procreate, so you grant survival of the species. You do what needs to be done so that can happen, meaning you eat, you hunt, you provide food, shelter, clothing, whatever you require, so the species can roll forward. Everything else that's come after that, man's search for meaning and happiness, blah, 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 comes after, right? Those are other layers of existence that exists up to, the, to spiritual realization. But where we all start and where we're all exactly the same is we're meant to procreate. And our bodies are built to procreate. And this is true for men and women. And completely irrelevant to masculine and feminine how it's used it's you have a woman's body it doesn't matter if you're gay or straight or both or none uh, your body has ovaries and your body's built a certain way so that you could technically reproduce for the most part if you don't your genetic strain dies out and then that was that right? so we all essentially come from a long line of people who have successfully reproduced. No, you know, no secret there. And as such, we are built as women um, to be able to do that, which requires certain things. One thing it requires, on a very basic level, is being able to ovulate, being able to uh, breastfeed and maintain a pregnancy. So how do you do that? Well, you eat. And idea you eat. Yeah. Ideally, you eat carb-rich sweet foods because that's what gives you the most bang for the buck when it comes to maintaining ovulation, maintaining pregnancy, maintaining breastfeeding. So now imagine back in the days when uh, there were no stores and you had to forage for uh, your sustenance and also just imagine in most parts of the country unless you were lucky enough as a genetic strain to have been born in I don't know the Caribbean or somewhere like that right where there's always mangoes ha hanging off the trees if you happen to come from a genetic strain that came from northern Europe for instance you'd never seen a fruit in your life maybe an apple if you were lucky you yeah. know even till up to 150 200 years ago um you know, there wasn't 
trade of foreign you know, vegetables and, and fruit. So as a woman, one of the main things that guarantees um, that everything stays the way it is from the olden days is eating sweets. So, of course, sweets back then meant you got an apple or some berries or some whatever, uh, raspberries or you know, some blackberries or something like that. It didn't mean uh, massive amounts of chocolate or Twinkies from the 7-Eleven or things like that or <laughs> Coke. But the mechanism is still the same which is the mechanism that allows for sustenance. Uh, so that's the, that's the underpinning of that mechanism. The other mechanism that's very important that we're not going to talk about for this particular series because this is about embodiment, but another mechanism is, of course, finding a good mate, which essentially means somebody who can provide food, sustenance, and safety, uh, which gives you a pretty good insight into what we're still oriented towards, no matter how much we can negate that, n because it's no longer a necessity, right? Everybody can take care of themselves. But biologically, there are certain things that we still orient. So for the basics of, of birth and reproduction to happen, the body had to have a certain sustenance, and the body also had to have a certain dynamic which was you had to be a able to actually be in your body, use your body, and feel your body. Otherwise, you wouldn't survive. So energy in a woman, or the, the energy needed for a woman to do the things women were built for is pretty much from here to here. Yeah. That's really the area that requires the most juice, the most power, the most input, the most energy. And so... Based on that, the um, aliveness, both of the sensual sexual nature and the reproductive aliveness is the same. It happens down here. And when you see any kind of tribal depictions, tribal dances, women cooking together in more uh, you know, aboriginal cultures, of indigenous cultures of all kinds, you always see women squat. Right? Nobody sits on a chair. This is how you cook. This is how you give birth. This is how you, you know, cut things. This is how you chop things. You don't actually ever sit on a chair or stand on a chopping board because this is the area that needs to be used. And um, you never see uh, indigenous women who can't get off the floor, even at an old age, right? So that, of course, translates you know, more emotionally, developmentally into a lack of stagnation because everything's constantly moving and you're doing all these things and, and tribal dances and worship and ritual all centers around this area, meaning your ass, your thighs, your belly, your genitals, uh, your power center, you know, in, 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 in the martial arts traditions they talk about the Dantian or the Hara. All of that's the area that's natively enriched and alive uh, in women when we are given a chance to just live the way uh, we are meant to live. And I'm saying this in parentheses because <coughs> I'm not advocating that we're all going back to, you know, tribal coconut pounding. I'm just saying, even though I personally would be totally up for that <laughs> at this point in my life. <laughs> but uh, I'm saying this to say the dynamics of our body are such that the very area that needs the most attention to be sexually, sensually, reproductively, psychically as well, to be alive is this area, right? This is where all uh, real, you know, this psychic thing is all the fine realm stuff. This is where you know if your kid has gotten itself in trouble or when something's wrong, right? It's like that area over the diaphragm in the solar plexus where you can pretty much navigate most of your life from if you are sensitized, right? So I'm saying all of this to say that, of course, modern life as it is now, the world that uh, we're in now, emphasizes none of that. It's all sitting in chairs, uh, doing computer work, thinking, speaking, texting, emailing, meetings. It's a highly cerebral world in which you use all the energy that you could use down here and you kind of squeeze it up and you tighten it so it's available to go up 
and out towards a forward movement. So it's a, and you can notice this if I would, and I will actually in a moment. If you get up, you notice that what you're going to do when you get up is you gather yourself and then you spring up and into action, which is perfectly normal. Except if you do this repetitively, not only when you need to get out the door, but when you make a plan, when you do your, uh, you know, work, when you, in my case, you know, I teach, which is a constant penetration so to speak you know a forward pushing emotion and knowing where it's going it's all of that which by its very nature tightens the body so the classic modern woman diseases are the are the things that that uh, come from the tightening of the body the tightening of the neck the headache the migraine the this whole area you know, the midline of the body dries up, tightens in, people are incredibly tense, can't relax anymore. Eventually, you know, things happen also to the reproductive organs and so on and so on. So, and it's not to say those are the only reasons, mind you, right, uh, that things are going wrong in people's bodies, but it's definitely um, something that has now been studied and proven that the lack of movement and the lack of... This is also true for men in a different domain. We're talking specifically about women's bodies. It's not like guys don't need to move. It's, a, it's just a completely different body dynamic. And we're talking specifically about women's bodies. So all that tightening, all that uh, gathering, all that forward motion, all that cutting off right here under the, you know, over the solar plexus, under the breasts, over the solar plexus is where most people have a cutoff. Because you, because you sit like this, right? For the most part, we sit, you know, we sit. However, we sit, this here cuts off. But it also cuts off, of course, because underneath there is where all the feeling happens. So when you have to perform a job, you can't just feel whatever you're feeling and expressing it freely unless... You're an actress, perhaps, but then, you know, that's not true either because you have to perform whatever function that particular emotion means. But very few people and very few women have the luxury of freely expressing their emotions as they rise in a workplace. Good luck. <laughs> you know, so that all said, we're cut off from the vital parts of our body, both physically, emotionally, spiritually. And that cut off makes it so that um, a lot of the energetics are not being processed, both the energetics of emotion and the energetics of, you know, lymph, waste product, digestion, menstruation, all of those things. It's, it, to me personally, it's all the same. I don't make a big, you know, distinction what's somatic, uh, you know, to me is what's somatic, you know, that could be a combination of actual physical things, mental things, spiritual things, um, emotional things. But this is the area we should concern ourselves with from the, you know, under the breasts down to the knees, so to speak. And it's the area that gets the least airtime and play. Uh, you have other considerations. Other considerations are uh, trauma. So things that have happened to you, both physical trauma, accidents, being beaten, you know, ha having had unpleasant experiences all of in, in the body, you know, surgeries, things like that. So physical trauma to the body, which of course causes the body's traumatic response. Emotional trauma, sexual trauma, the trauma of living a life, right? So even if you had a perfectly fine upbringing, by the time you are 30 or so, uh, or even 25 at this point, <laughs> bless you. Uh, so by the time you are 25, you've accumulated enough instances of having witnessed and seen and experienced and processed rather unpleasant things, even if it's just your, you know, your relationships, that there's an accumulation of things that you don't want to feel. So then come the coping mechanisms, right? The coping mechanisms kick in. And these coping mechanisms make it such that you can actually function really well without ever having to really deal with it. 
partly because you can't deal with it for whatever reason. It's not the right time, you're not equipped, it's too painful, you'd lose your shit if you would actually you know, consider it. You don't want to deal with it, you're not even aware it's an issue. All of those are possible. Right? You know, and then you have something like you were talking about, a natural disaster where personal well-being is no longer you know, a priority at all. It's just about somehow the collective surviving. That's a whole other layer of not dealing with certain things. So, so all of that said, these are all the reasons why we typically are not fully feeling and alive and expressed in our bodies to various degrees, right? And that's not necessarily to say that one has to be constantly expressed and alive and, and full in all these areas. These are just uh, the considerations when you notice that you're stuck, when you notice that you have certain coping mechanisms that no longer serve, when you notice that your sexual relational interactions are less full, satisfying, or... Um, filled with sexual spark as you want them to be. When you notice your body drying up or you know, certain things starting to go, these are the considerations that, that we look at, right? is what's, what's happening here, so to speak. Right? So that said, I'm just going to mention this very briefly. This is not a trauma workshop, so I'm just mentioning this as it pertains to what we did this morning. And continue to do when we are exposed to actual or perceived threat because the body makes no difference so you you talking about some horrible thing that happened to your friend and oh my god isn't this and then she got this and then this happened your body produces the exact same you know neurotransmitter responses adrenaline everything else as if it actually happened so being stuck on the freeway, going somewhere and having a massive spike of adrenaline because, oh my God, I'm late, I'm, I'm uh, you know, that kind of a thing is as dangerous to the nervous system as the actual thing happening. Mm -hmm. And so most of our threats these days are not actual threats. Very few people are in, in this part of the world are endangered mm -hmm. or in this workshop, let's say, because there's people endangered all the time. But not many people in here experience danger to their life on a daily basis. Most people in here experience uh, adrenaline spikes of that nature on a daily basis. Right? And that particular thing results in either fight, right, which is high adrenaline, ready to go and attack it, flight, high adrenaline, get the fuck out of here as fast as one can, which mostly you can't because it's not a real threat and it usually often has to do with your job or your relationship so you get anxiety. You know, so there's all these things that happen because it's not actual threat. Right? It's not like the saber tooth tiger shows up. We all run for the, for the gate, we close the gate and then it's like, right? and then it's done. It's there is no action in a lot of these threats. So both the fight and the flight response never get completely lived out. <coughs> so what mostly happens these days is what one could call coping, which is a freeze mechanism. So a freeze mechanism is you hunker down. Depending on your disposition, you either go up and out or you go down and you're like a toad. Right? It's that, that's a disposition thing. It has to do with your breath and how the body is structured. But it's like, I'm not moving. It's, there's, there's nothing happening. I, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. You know? Or the other one is like, I am fine. It's all okay. Bang. You hurt yourself. You, you, know, you have bruises all over because you can't feel your body. In this year, you can't feel your body either, but this looks kind of calm. And a lot of people who do this look like, you know, they got it all handled. While internally, it's like, ah! You know, and, but, but of course, somebody who goes up and out, it's easier to say, see because they're all over the place. And, you know, you go like, whoa, whoa, calm down, right? But the calm one has the same thing in the freeze mechanism. So that all said... The things that we're doing this weekend and the things w that I'm generally teaching in women's practice 
are the principles of relaxation, sensitizing, and being in your body with the full feeling of what's occurring. So the first one uh, to talk about is the first thing we did this morning, right, which is relaxation. So not just the relaxation of, okay, relax, you know, watch your breath, not that kind of relaxation, but the, f the actual melting away, the dissolving of the knots of the body, both physical knots, meaning knots in your tissues, and emotional knots, which can manifest either as somatic pains in the body, bad feelings, or loopy, you know, recurring thoughts uh, where you just can't let go of something. And so the relaxation aspect is a vital aspect of getting underneath the things that makes women less capable of being full and juicy and sensual and expressed and responsive in the world is the lack of relaxation, right? as evidenced in the massive tension in the, in the base of the body, right? the pulled up pelvic floor. The reason I'm saying that's an all other topic is I personally don't think kegels work for most people because their pelvic floors are already so tight that by the time they start getting all you know, weak in the pelvic floor, it's because the muscle's worn out. And so more kegels doesn't really, really work because that muscle is essentially fatigued and hence. It's not true for some women with multiple children and stuff like that, but the classic stress response is pulling up from the perineum, pulling up, you know, clenching the genitals, clenching the ass, the asshole, the whole area, essentially. There's no nicer word than asshole. I like that word a lot. But <laughs> I could say the sphincter. But whatever you want to call it, everything gets clenched and pulled up, and at some point it just fatigues and gets worn out. And then, of course, when you then go, I must more, do more kegels, the best you can possibly hope for is a little bit more control over an already fatigued muscle. There's other ways to go, but that's a different workshop altogether. But so that pulling up or pulling away right, is, is the thing that we're counteracting in the relaxation. Not only that, but also using uh, only the amount of uh, tension necessary to get the job done and not adding all this extra push to the occasion. So relaxation is the first principle. And then, of course, relaxation allows you to become sensitive to both the, the aspects of your body that you're dealing with. Right? You can suddenly feel that something aches. I'm sure you've all had that where you think you're perfectly fine and you go... And, it happens to me sometimes after a flight. I'm like, oh, this wasn't bad. Then I go to the chiropractor and I lay down on the table. And in the three or four minutes it takes her to heat up that stuff she uses with the, she does a laser thing. I'm like, oh, this all hurts like crazy, right? You suddenly realize how much pain you were in, but you couldn't really feel it because everything else was so loud. So once you have enough relaxation, you can actually listen to the signals of your body. But so essentially the, the, the sensitizing to what's happening in your body, what's happening in another person's body, what's happening around you, what's happening in the, in the biggest picture can only happen when you can feel yourself. Because all feeling of one human comes through the feeling organs of that human. You can't feel another person if you don't know what's happening here. That's just projection at that point. Right? So how we really feel other people is we feel our own body in response to their body. We feel our own emotion in response to their emotion. And that particular feedback mechanism gets disrupted if you can't be sensitive. And then, of course, if you're not sensitive to what's happening, how are you going to be responsive to what's happening? Uh, and that's both true internally, like for instance, how can you say no when you don't know that somebody just trespassed on you? And it takes you like three days till you go, oh shit, that guy really violated me, right? And then of course you say something and the guy says, well, why didn't you say something, right? And you go, well, I didn't know. Well, that's a, that, that can be a deadly mistake, 
right? In the in the wild, that would be a deadly mistake. Right? So, responsiveness f within yourself translates into responsiveness outside of yourself, which is useful both in um, living life and sexually because of course sexual responsiveness comes from how much are you with your body how much can you actually feel uh, but emotional responsiveness uh, is the exact same you know uh, area you can't actually say no till you know that it's a no in your body so before assertiveness training or boundary setting comes knowing when your body shows something right and the same is true with pleasure training, right? You can, you can use all the dildos in the world and take all the supplements and have all the oils and all the accoutrements of, you know, we are sexy women now. If you can actually feel anything, um, it, you just need harder and harder stimulation to feel, you know, at all. So resensitizing is both uh, important for your basic self-regulation and self-government and the exact same principles apply for sexual and sensual pleasure and many other aspects. Last thing I want to say is um, everything I said about the, a woman's body, responsiveness, sensitizing, embodiment, meaning being able to stay in your body and move your body happily and freely as your body you know, sees fit, so to speak, then allows you to actually be life, right? So another more, slightly more esoteric way of uh, describing what, what a woman's purpose is other than procreation is she's life itself, right? And most of us identify very strongly with that as evidenced in the colors and the, <laughs> the jewelry and, you know, all of those kind of things is life is lived through our bodies. Once again, it's not like men don't have that. It just expresses very differently. But when you are alive and life moves through you, which is also another way of being responsive in the bigger way, then your expression is the expression of life, both in the chaotic and the uh, structured, both in the color and, and the black and white, but it's just life moving through you and you become life instead of controlling life. Right? This is where we come into the whole masculine and feminine uh, discussion, right? where, where people then say, well, the masculine controls life, the feminine is the chaos of life. And that's true, and we have both. But as women, we are life givers, regardless of your sexual orientation, regardless if you like to get fucked or want to fuck. Right? Your, your, your body's disposition is one of giving life, of um, giving food, of um, you know, giving sustenance, uh, in, in, in the olden days, you would also give death because you'd kill the chicken so you could feed your family. I mean, we've you know disconnected from all of that. But you're essentially the birther and destroyer. And when you look at Hindu mythology, for instance, right, there's lots of archetypal depictions of that life giver, life taker in all her forms, right, from the very, very beautiful Shri Devi Lalita to Kali and everything in between, Durga as the wife and you know, Lakshmi as the abundance and so on and so on. So that aspect of being life itself can't be lived, which is our birthright, really, truly our birthright, is to be life itself when you have to control how life flows. So the cutting off of all of this is a cutting off of life itself in a certain way. And there's no surrender possible, both sexually, spiritually, and as being life when this is all shut down. And the last thing I want to say about that is that one of the, the most important things in everything that I've just said is uh, that it's the resistance to how life happens that causes the huge suffering, right? You can't do anything about how life ha happens. There's no way about that. Whole religions have been made around, you know, uh, first noble truth, uh, you know, life is suffering. But the suffering piece is the piece where you resist 
The, la the loss of energy that we experience for the most part is, and why there's so much fatigue and all of those kind of things, is the resistance. It's not the thing happening in itself because responsively that would move through you. You'd have the experience. It would be gone. It's the, no, no, don't want this. Oh, this is not right. Oh, I'm late. Oh, I don't want to eat this. And that's the tension that, that we all have in our bodies that keep us from feeling because it's a constant battle with wanting to control life while life wants to just flow through us. And that makes for this really not so fun tension in most women where one part of us wants to just be life and the other part of us wants to make sure that we really fuck life well, right? <laughs> All the while, you know, somehow hoping that some guy will come and take over the fucking, so to speak, meaning the directing and guiding and penetrating while we would happily surrender, except that our whole body, mind, and every muscle in our body is trained to constantly, you know, not do that. So... Everything I've just said translates into the ability to actually be open to life coming through us, both in the form of pleasure, uh, in the form of a relationship, in the form of children, in the form of creativity, in the form of money, however, however you want to slice it. <laughs> 